navigation system that you've built, on how many drones is it, is it there? And on how many drones is it installed? So it's open source, which is great because it means that everybody can use it, but it also means we actually don't know. We estimate that it's in about one million devices today, and that number is growing because as an open source system, it's very good to adapt, to tune it for specific verticals, and that makes it very interesting for commercial drones, which is the biggest growth segment in the industry right now. Now, is it, is it used all over the planet? China also? A anywhere? Pretty much? Yeah, it's, it's very international. Okay. Military also? Well, again, we don't know. Uh, we just know it's very good technology, and we know it's very good technology to fly drones uh, very accurately. So we have to assume that it's uh, the best platform to fly any type of uh, small drone. That's a very uh, diplomatic answer. <laughs> now, wh why would you say did your navigation system take off? I mean, why did it become the most successful one? What made it so special? I mean, I, I guess a lot of people have tried and have worked on it and kind of programmed software for it. Why did, was this the breakthrough? I think there are two factors. One is we really wanted it to be really good technology and to be easy to adopt. And so being open source, being very modular, it's a very good base to base a product on. And the product part, that's also important. We always made the system not just open source and shared with a developer community, but we also made sure that from a technology and from a legal perspective, it's easy to adopt for companies. For example, it has a very permissive open source license that doesn't add much legal complexity in using it. What does it mean? I'm a it, it essentially complexity. means we have a license that requires you to do two things, like do not sue us if it goes wrong, because we okay. told you. <laughs> and the second part is you have to attribute that you've used it. But other than that, it's completely free to use, so you can do anything with it. Now, you told me when we spoke, we, we've, we've been in contact for many years, on and off, we met, and obviously we talk about the drone industry. And it seems that the drone industry is now at some sort of an inflection point. What's going on? So, the drone industry is going through a huge transformation. It's going to a massive transformation where we had, just a couple of years ago, companies that wanted to do everything. They wanted to do the drone, the software on your mobile phone, the communication protocol, like literally everything, the plastics. And many people thought that as more and more companies went out of business, and we have a couple behind us here, or stopped doing drones, that actually it's a failing industry, but actually that's not true at all. It's not a failing industry. It's a cycle that every industry goes through. And I looked back and like looked at, okay, which other industries went through that same cycle? And you can think of smartphones, you can think of other things. Smartphones are not such a great example because smartphones have numbers in the hundreds of millions. Like a chip manufacturer for a smartphone, like for, for less than like 10 million units, they're not even picking up the phone. But drones are a market that's still in the single digit million units. So the analogies of the smartphone market do not work well. But there is a market that's very electromechanical. It has to do with moving things. It also had its infancy stage, and that's automotive. And what we're looking at here, that's, that's a car that's 100 years old. And the interesting thing about the automotive industry, exactly 100 years ago, is that we have it's starting in 1899 with essentially a car. And what I found really funny, because that brand today doesn't have this technology pioneering spirit today, like the car on the left, that's an Opel. And that would, nobody would associate that today with Opel, but they actually built one of the first like mass manufactured cars. But back then, every bolt was bespoke. So every bolt, in the car, every screw, everything was custom. There were no norms. 
before 1817. And as you can see, the number of car manufacturers in the US reached about 5,000 shortly after 1900. And then you saw this sharp decline. And the question is, what happened? And it's very simple. Once your machinery gets more complex, you cannot manufacture every bolt yourself. It just doesn't work. It, do it stops to scale. And so instead of doing everything essentially in a shed in your garden, a whole car, companies started to specialize. You started to have the automotive industry, which today is carried by tier one suppliers to do like they have all the knowledge. They have the knowledge about seats. They have the knowledge about engine controllers, which is also the reason why now several German car manufacturers are in trouble, because they all bought from Bosch. The CEO of Bosch was just here. Yeah. <laughs> and so I hope he's still here. No, he just left. Uh, that's but, unfortunate. But the, but the chief legal is here. <laughs> Sebastian, where are you? There. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so, essentially, what, what, what happened in the car industry is happening now in the drone industry. It's happening in every industry. It's not special. It happens over and over. You have initially vertical integration, then companies specialize. And today, and then they specialize, and they start to have product market fit. And the last two cars, that's also what I wanted to show. Like, after 1920, you had product market fit. Cars did not change much, right? A 1920 Roadster, well, it, the design language is different, but it still looks roughly like a Roadster. And in 1960, well, yeah, again, bit different design language, but same parts, same type of wheels, everything the same. And like 50 years later, like that, that Aston Martin is like still representative in, in terms of how it looks. And the same thing is happening with drones right now. We start to have product market fit. But what are the bolts today? The bolts today are software. And that's why we see a sharp increase in the adoption of open source, a sharp increase in standardization. And that's why I've uh, co-founded Kev with Kevin uh, Altarian, which is essentially the Red Hat of drones. It's a company doing standard software for drones. So uh, a lot of uh, drone manufacturers license your software, buy your services also to keep it all up to date. And what, what, what other services, what, what is your specialization now with drones? Where do you help drone manufacturers? Where are you coming? I mean, they could just buy, they could just download the software. It's free of charge, it's open source. W what do you do now with your company that you just started? So what we do is we essentially help them go to market. We help them through the full cycle in developing the drone, making sure it's working, making sure it follows the standards, and then we help them operate it. So we're not actually selling any software. You can just roll on your own. But we're helping anybody making the use of open source more, um, well, not more elegant, but more effective, more productive. And what you can see on, the, on this chart behind me is software is actually not static, right? You start to add more and more and more components on top of it. And then if you look at the overall amount of software that's on a drone, it forms this exponential curve. And it's hard as a single company to deal with any type of exponential curve. And that is essentially sort of the core value we're, we're offering to companies. And the beauty of it is it's all open source. Like you can contribute, you're not depending on the company, we just help the ecosystem. And so we're 100% aligned with the development community that I created 10 years ago, which was a bit ahead of its time. Now people want to talk to me. Like 10 years ago, like the standard answer was like, yeah, we know how to do that ourselves. Mm -hmm. Certification is an issue. I mean, eventually these drones, especially if you use commercial drones, if you want to do package delivery, if you want to be a platform of, you know, whatever, uh, eventually these things have to be certified by the regulatory uh, organizations. Like we have somebody here from the Bundesamt für Zivilluftfahrt. They are responsible for certifying stuff in Switzerland. Then you have European agencies. You have the FAA in the US. How do you see this certification game panning out? I mean, will they all be certified? What is the process? What should countries do?
to certify drones. Which drone should be certified, which should be say, no, this is illegal, we don't want them in the air in our country. So I, I have a pretty clear view on certification. I think for flying cars, flying cars will, in my view, start with pilots. Because the value of a flying car is that you very quickly get from A to B and you can avoid traffic. Like Silicon Valley is like the perfect deployment scenario for that or other areas where you have gridlock. Uh, Zurich, Switzerland with its fantastic public transportation system is actually not such a great example because most of the value that you would get out of it you can actually realize today just by taking the train. <laughs> Got some SPV people here. <laughs> but but, but for, for other countries, for other locations, there will be value in jumping over like two hours of gridlock just with a relatively short couple miles, couple kilometer hop, which these vehicles will be able to do. And I think that will be a service with pilots and it will just follow standard aviation rules in the initial go to market. But then over time, that will be more and more automated. And the beauty of that is, as we start to build bigger drones, as we start to go beyond line of sight, which is one of my core areas of technical focus right now, we also start to care more about certification, about reaching higher levels of assurance, and Switzerland is, thanks to the uh, FOCA, a fantastic um, testing ground for that. And so I see, I see these industries eventually converge, but not for five or, or maybe even 10 years. And so we're really focused on making sure we deliver, continue to deliver low cost, quick time to market software for drones. We're not trying to build autopilots for flying cars, but I'm sure that we will have this discussion again in a couple of years. You're very committed to Zurich. You're from Zurich. You just spend a lot of time in Silicon Valley. You said Zurich should be or will be a drone hub, a, a drone valley, so to speak. What's your take on Zurich as a hub for drones versus Silicon Valley or, or other places? I think there's very unique talent here. And we just saw two weeks ago with another Chinese drone manufacturer opening an office here that that's also seen internationally. And uh, we will have a discussion with a US company, I think in one or two weeks, about relocating parts of their offices to Zurich. So I think it's starting to get critical mass. I'm, of course, telling everybody when I travel that this is the place to be. And I'm sure more professors, more friends from the industry do the same. And I do believe that we have here a unique mix of talent, regulatory framework, and quality of life that really creates a focal point for this industry.